Yeah. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> what what goes on there? Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. And, For real. you know, mm-hmm. Dakota's just making these, like, little comments about, you know, we got to stay safe, like, mm-hmm. you stick with the security and whatever. And I'm just like, what is going on? <laughs> This is insane. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, the people there are amazing, but like with, that was the Texas I envisioned when I moved here. Oh, yeah. It was like the deserty. <laughs> yeah. The guy yeah. who picked us up was this Amer- like amazing Texan guy with his hat on, his cowboy boots, like yeah collared shirt like that that i envisioned and it was so i wish we had like a texas sound right now (laughs) yeah yeah but it was it made me really i felt like a child like being kind of like opened up to like the true like no there's differences within states and Mm -hmm. i just felt like a naive child in that moment it was really funny utah is is very diverse like it is we have um like desert area and mm-hmm. right. like rocky mountain area snowy mountains and, yeah yeah so it, i'm really i love it yeah i, I'm, I love we're the really blessed to live in such a um, diverse yeah state but i can't imagine how diverse texas is well, because it, you could fit like just so huge right. you could fit a few utahs inside yeah. texas <laughs> well so when we so i drove um Bless my dad and my best friend at the time. We drove my car and all my stuff when I moved to Atlanta. And it was a close to a 20 hour driving day. Mm. And like, you know, I, driving through yeah. state to state, it was really cool. Like, whatever. We were having fun. Me and my girlfriend were in my car driving. And then as soon as we hit Texas, you felt like you it just went on forever. Because mm-hmm. it took a long time to get from the and border of Texas. Real- pretty flat also oh, yeah. Right? yeah it is yeah, yeah. so well it's just to at least for me i felt like we kept seeing the same thing because mm-hmm. like going through louisiana we went through like the bayous and everything like yeah. that and so mm-hmm. it just you felt like it kept going on forever <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. but yeah texas is very different and um it's definitely one of those things that uh atlanta has a lot of different types of people and um as well but it's one of those things especially living in austin where there's a lot of just like diverse groups of people Mm -hmm. that um it kind of makes me very grateful for the fact that i like have gotten out of my comfort zone and i'm in a place where it is a true i see a true melting pot Mm -hmm. instead of people who truly think the same things and who um are always in the same state of mind Uh, there's so much growth here there's so much change and it's definitely something that uh, before I moved here I was very like I said very naive and didn't really know that much about it um so I I think the cool one of the things that I like about Utah the most is the public land Mm -hmm. because um if I'm not mistaken doesn't doesn't Texas like isn't it at all owned by someone like for the it's most part? Of, yeah. Yes. It has some of the most uh, private owned yeah. mm-hmm. uh, land in the United States, which is insane because I was actually driving um, through where around where we live. It's called the uh, country or the hill country. Um, It's pretty hilly around here and it's got a lot of different like elevation. And it was very interesting. I was driving around and um, I was about to go shooting and the buddy of mine who was driving us was like, you know, um, there's a ranch privately owned here. That's like 3000 acres. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what do they do? And they're like, they just keep it. It's mm-hmm. like, stock it just sits there. Them here. It's, it, <laughs> yeah, do yeah. they hunt Basically, on it or what? Yeah. Yeah. So they okay. hunt on it. There's animals, but like to the people who truly own it, it's like company stock to them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so he sure. was explaining to me that this is like their their investment. This is oh. like their worth is this land. And I was like, they don't want to just sell it and have like cash value. And they're like, no. That because, would be so much money. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it'd be a lot of money. But to him, it was like as more and more land is sold here and it's more scarce to find yeah. this property value. And like up. five, ten yeah. years, yeah, mm-hmm. it's going to be insane for them. But this is stock to them. Yeah, man. Um, 
That's cool. And I can't imagine because of how much other privately owned land there is, how many other people are have that exact same thought process. Oh, sure. Yeah. I'm sure there's like some people that own 50,000. Yeah. Acres. I'm sure there's like, because there's some spots out there you're like, I've, I've driven through there and I'm like, mm-hmm. what, like, what, what do people even use with this? There's like nothing for, you know, a hundred miles. There's nothing. Yeah. And it's just. Well, who owns that? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, Someone. and it's funny because um, Dakota and I have a friend, uh, his name's Brandon Harrell, and his family owns um, property uh, way past uh, Dakota's house out in the country. And it's like four or two to three hours, depending on where you're coming from, in Austin out of the city. And it's like a, another, it's like another place. Mm, like whenever yeah, I'm there sure. and like, spending time i'll take the girls out there for like a weekend and just hang out um and like spend oh, like away from the city and it's like another i don't know like it's private island almost yeah. to us because mm-hmm. his family owns um so much acreage he has like deer on it cattle um all of these animals but it's like if i could do it i would do it too like yeah. it's their mm-hmm. own private getaway their own oasis I, like away really from cool. the craziness yeah yeah well and it's funny because I feel like Utah, um, as I lived in Washington for a while, we did travel to Utah a couple of times mm-hmm. that there are some places out there that kind of, I feel like I'm sure there are ranches out there, there are, that there are some big ones. Yeah. And people own, yeah, there, there are, I've been trying to get my family to all pitch in together and buy just a, yeah, a big, <laughs> cool, big chunk yeah, of land, a big chunk of land, build a couple of properties as a getaway. For our doomsday prepping, right? Exactly. It's, it's a no, practical just, thing. Well, well, just if there was something like that, yeah, for sure. But well, but mostly then you would have somewhere to, to for vacay. sure go. Well, and somewhere to vacate. Yeah, you know, somewhere where yeah. my kids can be like, "Hey, let's get away from school. Let's get away from everything." And even though we don't really live in the city, it's just like get away and just go out and just be in nature. You know, right. uh, for for a while. And if you had a you know a place that you already owned. You know, you're secure, you're safe. Well, that's why I say, like, about the public land. Mm-hmm. Right. It's um, so much of Utah is public, publicly owned. So mm-hmm. it's just uh, amazing. Oh, yeah. There's they it, out of, out of, uh, I don't remember the statistics. No, I'm going to slaughter it. But, anyways, <laughs> out of a bunch of national parks in the United States, there's a whole bunch that are just in even Utah. Yeah. We have yeah. a lot oh, of national 100%. parks. Oh, 100%. And, uh, I mean, well, you could go to Moab, which is where, where I lived for a little while and it's just beautiful arches, red, and you get all the cool colors and the, you know, all that kind of stuff, kind of the deserty, you know, arches. And then you can go up into the, up into the Rocky mountains yeah. areas and, uh, get snow capped mountains, get the best skiing, get like snowboarding, all that kind of stuff in. And, uh, I mean, you could do that if you just spend a week here, you could get both, <laughs> yeah. yep. you know, both in. So. It's pretty cool. Well, and so when I was in high school, um, my dad worked really closely. Uh, my dad's company had him work closely internationally, but he got very close with this French family, um, this amazing French man. And um, they came up with the summer between my junior and senior year that we kind of were going to do like an exchange of like children. <laughs> and so I spent a week in France. <laughs> And his daughter that's cool. spent yeah, that's a week in the United States. And um, it was very funny to me how, like, it's funny thinking back on it now, but it was, like, really jarring to me. I remember back then that, like, so in Georgia, there's this um, place called the Gorge. And you have to hike, like, three to four, I don't remember, it's an increment of miles in and out in order to get to the Gorge. Mm -hmm. Going in, it's all downhill. Going back, it's all exceptionally crazy (laughs) uphill. Like, Mm -hmm. insane. (laughs) And I remember, I remember, like, thinking, okay, we have to prepare. I got my hiking shoes on. Like, we were were a very active family. Um, The poor French girl did not know that you don't wear jeans to hike. (laughs) You don't wear sandals to hike. (laughs) Or, like, Converse. (laughs) Like it was, it was something that like, I just thought it was an automatic, like everyone knows how to do these things, Mm -hmm. but no, 
like we had to like take her shopping and be like (laughs) you need like comfortable shoes but Mm -hmm. on the flip side of that like when I would be told when I was staying in France with them like we stayed in Paris like we're gonna walk around all day I wore tennis shoes and like you know comfortable clothes while they were wearing like fancier things like they had like a different attire as well that like I was picked I remember standing on the sidewalk with them and someone not even listening to me talk was like oh look at this American (laughs) of course and it was just (laughs) and it was just really funny to me that like she had never even American (laughs) yeah well I remember I will never forget this guy he was like look at this little American girl and I just looked at him and I was like, excuse me. And he was like, you just proved my point and like walked <laughs> away from me. And I was mm-hmm. like, what is this? Yeah. Or like the fact that she had never driven a car or like, you know, there were. Or, well, I um, bet no mom. one, I bet no one picked out her being from France when she was in Georgia. No. I mean, well, I know, of course she yeah. spoke, but yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. But it was funny because her mom. Like, the biggest, like, push, at least for the mother, her mother, was go look at their nature in the United States. Go to the national parks with them. Like, mm-hmm. go and see all of, like, the vastness of it. Because, you know, they don't have that yeah. in Europe over there. Yeah. That it was so um, just eye-opening for her to see vast just nature. And it was just super eye-opening for her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. That's awesome. Yeah. And I, I, um, I don't know what the elevation is like there, but I never really realized the effects of elevation mm-hmm. until I went to basic training. And I went to basic training in Missouri, and mm-hmm. I could run so much faster than You're everyone. Like, hey, this yeah, is better than Utah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're at we're at like. 4,500 right here. Yeah. We're not even in the mountains. Yep. You know, so. Well, and it, it's funny because I remember, so uh, I lived in Washington, um, my freshman and sophomore year of high school, and uh, we had a ski condo in Idaho. We lived in Spokane, so it's right on the border of Washington and Idaho. And during, um, like, the summers or even in the winters, my dad would have me run with him in the mountain, Mm. um, like on the trails and like the difference of that type of like, like you're talking about, like your lung capacity, basically difference with the oxygen was absolutely insane. Yeah. Yeah. And that thinking of of like doing that now is like, that's kind of crazy to me. Mm -hmm. There's an area in, um, Rocky mountain national park that mm-hmm. is the like the highest um elevation of the entire park and um it's sh- so like it affects you so much oh yeah I'm sure. right there i've i i have a um a friend that did a 100 mile race in colorado and it, all of it was over 14,000 feet yeah in leadville yeah. Yeah. It's so oh. insane. Yeah. I'm like, that is nuts. You're at 14,000 feet the whole time. So where no. do you train? Like, where do you train to build up that? You know, if you're training somewhere else and you're like, Hey, I'm going to go do this race. And then you go there, like you're training yeah. in California and then you go. To, yeah. <laughs> to well, Colorado. we're, suck. we're actually going to be interviewing a girl from Leadville. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Well, so then you said you're a sports scientist. What is mm-hmm. like the truth behind those like math? You know, so, the one like Okay, so let me let me tell you. They they do not simulate uh like elevation. They don't. Okay. They, because you don't get the same unless you there there are some, literally it would be like twenty or thirty thousand dollars. You could buy one that would simulate some type of uh elevation rate. But, mm-hmm. but it seems like but it can't it can't change the the partial pressure of oxygen yeah, like you can it, when you go it's up in no the yeah there's no way to get that but what they do do it does um help with training because it would be like um almost like just breathe, running and breathing through a straw right so okay. if i started running and breathing through a straw my my body has to work harder to get, to to do the same um task yeah. right 
and therefore it adapts by becoming stronger. So you could still use it at 